voice of new life starts now. Good morning and welcome to New Life Baptist Church. If this is the first time you're with us, we are glad to have you here and excited to and study the Word of God together. We're extremely thankful that you came, whether you're watching online or in person. Again, we welcome you. We, as a church, care more about the fact that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior than anything else in the world. And we want you to know that from the very beginning. If you don't know Christ and you've never found new life in Him, we'd love to show you how you can find new life in Christ. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, then everything that follows that is discipleship. We're growing. We're learning together in the Word of God. We have the awesome privilege to study His Word every single Sunday. Oh, I was hoping that maybe we'd be a little bit excited about that. But we have the privilege to do that. I would invite you to take your copy of the Word of God this morning and turn to the New Testament book of Acts. The New Testament book of Acts, as we continue our new sermon series that we started last Sunday morning, entitled, One Anothering. And we'll be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 41 and down through verse 47 for our scripture reading. We started into our new sermon series last Sunday morning, and I already understand this morning that time is not my friend. And I may talk very quickly this morning, you may have to go back and you may have to watch the video of this again to catch the things that you missed because I'm not going to slow down. But what we began looking at is the idea of the, the one another's. And the Bible lists 59 one another statements in Scripture showing that God expects us to behave toward other believers. In fact, it's impossible for us to live that out unless we are in a fellowship of believers. To be one with another means that you are with another. And if you're not with another, then how can you practice the one another's? We understand we can practice those in our families, we can practice those in our jobs, but where God intended for us to exemplify those is within the context of the local church because the church is people, not a building. And we dove into this. In our culture that's filled with hatred and anger, Christ's followers are to live, we're to love like Christ. But how can a church, a collection of people, of varying walks of life, different backgrounds, jobs, beliefs, ideas. How can we do the job that God has called us to do as the church? Over and over again, the New Testament writers exhorted us as believers to engage in specific activities and to have attitudes that would help the local church function effectively and to grow spiritually. And when we fail to do those Number one, we're not healthy as a church, but other than that, we're not able to biblically carry out the mandated task of the Great Commission because the gospel witness is hindered. And we started into this last Sunday morning. Frequently, the writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, employed a unique word in the Greek language for this mutual process. That Greek word is alelon, usually translated as one another. In one word in Greek, it becomes two word in English. But it is used 59 times in the New Testament. In fact, the entirety of the New Testament uses it 100 times. But in 59 of those occurrences, they are commands on how we are to or not to respond to each other. Paul used it 40 of the 59 times, meaning he understood the one another's. He got it. And he wanted us to get it. 40 of the 59 times he uses it, and actually of those references, there are 23 separate one another commands in the New Testament. And over the coming Sundays, thankfully we're not going to look at all 23 this morning, but we're going to dive into these and study these. How do we one anothering? Because it's not just that I'm going to respond this way at one moment in time, I'm to do this for the rest of my life. And how is it that these actions and attitudes that we ought to have help us in building up the local body of Christ? We started last Sunday morning with the foundational one another. It's a non-negotiable. The Bible says that we are members of one another. To be a member means that you are included. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a member of God's universal church. Amen? You're part of the body of Christ. But that also means that you're a member with somebody else. 
And then on our understanding of it, there's also local churches and your members together with them in a local body. Because as we know, we don't get together with, as I said to one member, we don't get together with every member of the universal body because we don't have dead people that meet on Sunday. But we gather with the living body, the local church. What's still here? We gather with them. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 that we being many are one body in Christ and we're members of one another. In fact, if we really want to get into this, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians, Paul uses the word body some 30 times to illustrate the functioning of the church. It's a body of believers. And we started last Sunday morning by going all the way back to the beginning of the local church where the one another's begin so that we have the right mindset as we view them. You're in Acts chapter 2. Let's look at this for our scripture reading. If you need it, it's up on the PowerPoint. If not, follow along in your Bible beginning in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Our key sermon series idea that I mentioned last Sunday morning, and I'm going to mention it again this morning, is this. How we do or we don't relate to fellow believers tells the world much about our relationship with not only those around us, but ultimately Christ. And it's foolish for us to say that we love Christ and we don't respond in a Christ-like way to a brother or sister in Christ if we're members of one another. Before we dive into our sermon, you have some questions on your outline this morning. I want to highlight these as we get started. Number one this morning, again, what value does the local church have in the life of the believer today? Many people see church as something that's not important. It's not essential. You can stay home. You can watch it online. And I would remind you of what I said last Sunday morning. Church will never be church without one another. And you have to be with one another to be the church. The Bible says where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. That means if only two members of the church show up, guess what? The church is met. Amen? But it's hard to be the church if you're not together. Why do we value the local church? Because we need each other. A second question that pertains to our sermon this morning, is every member of the body of Christ as valuable as another? It's a great question. Does God see value in every member? And maybe that leads into our third question. Do we personally value every individual in the body of Christ for his or her uniqueness? Because the body, as we're going to see this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is not all the same. And there's diversity. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, I I don't know what you're talking about. Understand, the one another's starts with knowing the one who gave his life for another, Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it clear that Christ died for you. You were another that Christ gave his life for. And the Bible says he died for all of us. He died for for us because we could not pay the penalty for sin. And that because of another, we are able to be included in all the blessings that pertain to Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees another. He sees Christ in our place. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible is very clear. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know the greatest one? the one who died for another. Last Sunday, we looked at how fellowship starts with relationship. A relationship founded upon the completed work of Christ on your behalf is the basis for which you and I can fellowship. We have fellowship one with another because of Jesus Christ, who came and made that vertical relationship that we have with God. 
He, he tore, if you will, the veil in two. He opened it so we have direct access to God, but it's only through the person of Jesus Christ. And because of the relationship we have this way, we have the privilege to fellowship with people this way. And when we think about that, we looked at that last Sunday morning. There's three stages of that. A relationship started with hearing God's word. We have to hear the word of God. It starts with hearing. It continues with heeding the word of God. We looked at Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. They received the word of God. They obeyed it. And then it was solidified with honoring God's word. They were baptized. That's where that relationship starts, is by being obedient to God and to his word. We understand and we concluded with a reminder that God is the one who truly builds his church through the relationship with his children through the Savior Jesus Christ. In preparing for the message today, I came across a statement and I want to read it to you. A church can have all the programs in the world, but if people aren't changing, all you have is a religion and a show that takes place on Sundays. The church has always been about people. The transformation that takes place in the lives of ordinary people, which you've heard this morning through the testimonies that were shared. God changes people. And if you know Christ as your personal Savior, God is still changing you, amen? I'm a new creation in Christ. You know what? The creation hasn't reached the finished product yet. He is creating in me what He desires as I follow and live for Him. The gospel changes our lives. A church that functions for God's glory is comprised of many individuals with the same purpose in mind, working together for the spiritual growth of the body individually as well as collectively. You have some blanks on your outline. Let's get into this this morning. Every believer must understand that God has made each member of the body of Christ unique. Can we just agree with that this morning? God has made everybody unique. God didn't make everybody normal. He made us unique. Unique, and here's some things for us to consider. Unique in appearance. Think about the body of Christ. We don't all look the same. Some of us have hair. Some of us choose to have no hair. Some of us are just born without any. We have different complexion. Some have blue eyes. Some have green eyes. We look different. We're different in our appearance, but not only that, we're different in our character. We're unique in character. What makes you you? Some people are more character than others, right? But you know what? When you think about the church, characters are welcome because God makes us unique. We're different in character. We're different in our gifts. He gives to them gifts that differ according to His grace. We have different gifts. We have different abilities. That's another one of the blanks. Different abilities. We have different and we're unique in our maturity. Some people mature quicker than others. But we're all to be maturing. And I don't have all of those because we don't have time to look at all of them this morning. But so many other ways we are unique as members that make up the body of Christ. Before we go any further, let's stop and ask the Lord to bless our time of study and his word together as we look at the one another's. Father, quiet our hearts before you. Be with the message that you've laid upon my heart. Give me a clarity of thought this morning to proclaim that. That as we study through the one another's of scripture and as we set the groundwork for that, that you would help us not only to know what scripture says, but to live scripture out to implement these in our lives, in the relationships that we have with fellow believers, that the world around us would see a message of the gospel that is consistent. That if we say that we love Christ, we also love those who are Christ. That we exemplify the character of Christ in the way that we respond within the local church. Father, go before our time. Hide me behind the cross. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The beginning of the one another is part number two. This morning we're going to look at, last week we talked about the relationship that leads to fellowship. I want to talk about partnership this morning. Partnership because of the relationship. Really a church works because we partner with each other for something. 
We come together as believers. We partner together to accomplish the Great Commission. We understand that there is very little that can be done with one person, but the cause of the Great Commission can be fulfilled as we partner together for the gospel, to proclaim it, to fulfill it. I want you to notice the partnership in Acts chapter 2. All of these are plural pronouns. I know some of you don't like English, so you're going to have to bear with me. But if you take notes in your Bible, you can note all these. There are plural pronouns here. The idea that they partnered together. Look at verse 40. It refers to not individuals. It refers to them. Verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. Not just various individuals. It wasn't like he was nitpicking people. It goes on, verse 41. Then those. Hmm, that sounds like a pretty inclusive thing. Keep going. Verse 42. You find the word, and they continued. Verse 43, every, it says, then fear came upon every soul. Verse 44, now all who believed were together. Partnership. Verse 45, it mentions their possessions and goods. Verse 46, continue with one accord in the temple breaking bread, and they... And then it mentions again in verse 47, it uses the word those. There was a partnership. The church as it began was a partnership of believers who were working together to accomplish something. We as a local church are working together to accomplish the message of the gospel in this community. To proclaim it, to make disciples, to be faithful to the Great Commission. We have to partner together to do that. Many of you like the Peanuts comics by Charles Schultz. Lucy demanded that Linus change the channel on the TV, threatening him with her fist if he didn't comply. What makes you think you can walk in here and take over, asked Linus. Lucy replied, these five fingers. Individually, they're nothing, but when I curl them up together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Then came Linus's reply. Which channel would you like? Turning away from her, he looks at his fingers and says, why can't you guys get organized like that? And we laugh about that. But take your Bible and go with me if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if there was a passage to talk about the body of Christ the fact that we are members of the body, a passage to talk about how we're all together, but we're all unique, we're all a little different. It would be 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, Paul writes this, For as the body is one, there is one body of Christ, amen? Not multiple, there's one. There's one body, it's a universal body, and it's all in Christ. But then he says this, it has many members. Imagine what the membership role would look like to the body of Christ in heaven if we could somehow read all of it. I mean, it would take you a long time to just simply read through the names of those that came to know the Lord as personal Savior and then were baptized and added to the church in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people. Imagine reading all their names, hearing all their testimonies. He says, we're members. The body's one, but it's many members and all the members of that one body. There are many. So also is Christ. Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he addresses many of their problems, one of those being that of pride. One of the things that they had gotten off in was the fact that each one, as they accepted Christ as Savior and now had a relationship with Him, was just as valuable as another member of the body of Christ. But they began to do something which all Christians are prone to. They began to prefer one over another. And the value of members within the body of Christ no longer looked the same. It became skewed. And I would even dare say today in the church of God, we have to be careful of the same thing. When I look at the cross, I don't see God elevating certain people. I see level ground. The same grace that you received, I received. And so did everybody else. 
Because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if you're a member of the body of Christ, we partake of the same grace. You know, we're all different. And the Bible makes that very clear. The Corinthians were getting all puffed up about how one person could do one thing and somebody else couldn't. And you know what? That's great! You know, in the body of Christ, it sounds odd to say, but we should celebrate diversity. Because God hasn't made us all the same. You know what He has done? He has saved us all through the same person of Jesus Christ. He's all made each and every one of us, one another, partakers of His grace. The Corinthians were putting themselves above others and they saw that their gifting made them more important than others. Somebody had this gift and they were looked at as being more important. Paul tells them the body is made up of many individual, different, unique, diverse parts that every one of them is important. I want you to do something for me this morning. Look at the people that are sitting next to you. In front of you. The person on the other side of the aisle. And understand this this morning. They're not the same as you, right? God has made you, you. That sounds really emphatic to say. God has made you, you. And nobody else can be the you that God wants you to be. So be you in his church for his glory. He's made you. We don't look the same. We don't talk the same. We definitely don't all smell the same. And some of you can say amen to that. We don't all have the same things in common. Because that's what makes us different. We're not the same. The people that are across the aisle in front of you, behind you, they are themselves and you are you. Even identical twins are not completely the same. They are individuals. They are uniquely different. Each of us is unique. I have five kids and their likes and their dislikes are very, very clear. Some of them like snakes. Some of them hate snakes. Some of them will eat the hottest food that we have in the house, scorching buffalo Pringles, and the others want Lay's potato chips. Some of them want ketchup with their hot dog. Some of them want ketchup with things that we don't offer it to them to have as a side. <laughs> their, their likes and their dislikes, it makes them different. But you know what? I love all of my children just as God loves all of his children in the body of Christ. We're unique in appearance, unique in character, unique in gifts, in so many ways. But we're all members of the body. And before we jump into our text this morning, I want to summarize what Paul says about the body of Christ in three statements. You ready? Here they are. How it is that we are to understand it. And if you get nothing else out of my sermon this morning, I want you to get these three things because this is important to understand the one another's. Number one, these are truths to understand the body of Christ. Number one, the church body is made up of individual parts. Everybody else agree with that? Just like your car. Your car is made up of lots of individual parts. And when one of those parts goes missing, thankfully there's a repairman to get you the right part. But imagine if you had to replace the whole car every time. Oh boy, that would get expensive. The church body is made up of individual parts. Number two, the collective parts make the body function. Think about the, the, the parts of your car. You turn the key. Well, that's a part of the car. You turn the ignition, and the ignition turns the starter, and the, the battery in, in succession, it turns the engine over, and the, the fuel pump puts fuel into the engine, and it ignites through the spark plug, and you get combustion. All of you are saying, why are you talking about cars? Because if any of those do not function, you have no running, working car. You need all of those functions in the right order for it to work. The collective parts of the body make it function as it should. And that leads us to the third truth. The correct function of the body brings God glory. None of us like the feeling of going out to a car and turning it over and it goes click, 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 click. Click, 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 click. 
What's wrong now? This isn't how it's supposed to function, right? I wonder what God says when the church of God doesn't function as it's supposed to. Because anything short of what he set out for it isn't bringing him glory. It's falling short. Our passage this morning, Paul speaks to the church as being the body of Christ, and we need to jump into this. Four essential keys to understanding the partnership we have in the body of Christ. So let's look into this. Beginning in verse 14 through 16, we find the first of these. Partnership understands responsibility. Verses 14 through 16, it says this, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Each of us has a responsibility within the life of the church. We are to do more than simply come to church to punch our spiritual time card and take a seat. And there's a grave danger in people that do that. Again, the body of Christ, as we know, it's, it's living, it's breathing, it's alive. There is no sit on the sidelines in the church of God. And if you're on the sidelines, you better be cheering for all your worth for the people that are in the game. Because edification is one of the things we're to do with one another. Some believers try to discredit themselves in the body of Christ. They say, because I don't have fill in the blank. And someone else has fill in the blank. I don't think I can do that. Pastor, you don't understand. I can't talk to people about the Lord because I'm scared. And somebody else, they have the gift of evangelism, so you talk to, you talk to them. Well, you laugh about that. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm working and I just I don't have a lot of income and these people, they are clearly blessed more than I am of God. So maybe I'll take a rain check from giving and I'll just let them handle it, right? And you'd say, wait a minute. We all have a responsibility in the body of Christ to the body of Christ. Let's, let's do a really quick check this morning. How many of you have feet, ears, and eyes? Okay, anybody? All right, how many of you have all three? Okay, notice I didn't say hands because, never mind. Anyway, but you have all three. And to prove to prove what Paul is trying to illustrate here, let me illustrate it this way. Okay, feet, ears, eyes. Three of those, okay? Pick one of those three just for a moment, okay? Pick one. Everybody got one? Pick one of those three. Feet, ears, eyes. You got it? Okay. Now, you get whatever one you picked in your mind. Okay, here we go. Now, that's the only one that you get to use this entire week of those three. The other two are non-negotiable. You don't get them. Did you choose your feet, your eyes, or your ears? Now, if you were smart, some of you chose your feet, but I'm really scared for you because you're not going to hear, hear or see anything. You're just going to be running around aimlessly. For those of you that chose your eyes... At least you can see what's going on, but you can't get there. And you can't hear anything, but you can see it. And for those of you that chose your ears, um, it's going to be a long, cold, dark week going nowhere, but you can hear everything. And we laugh about that illustration. How many of you could function the whole week without all three of those? You'd say, nobody could. I didn't think you could. Each part of your body has a responsibility just as every member of the body of Christ has a responsibility. We each have a place of responsibility to fulfill, a contribution to make to the body of Christ. And no matter whether that's a big contribution or a small contribution, we have a responsibility. All of us are expected to participate in general things that we understand as part of the body of Christ. We're to pray. We're to worship. We're to evangelize. We're to just simply be there. We're to give. Whether it's the widow's might or a million dollars. We're to give. But there's also things that God expects us that are unique to who we are in the body of Christ. You understand with all of those things that I just mentioned, the foot, the ear, and the eye, they all give something unique to the body. The eye gives you images to recall later on. 
the ears allow you to determine the sounds you like to hear, the ones that you don't. It allows you to be able to understand things that you didn't as somebody else speaks and explains it. Your feet. You think about your feet for just a moment. The feet are unique because they allow us to go somewhere. It's interesting, in the Great Commission, the go is not the imperative. It's actually make disciples. And it's implied that we go and make disciples. God gave us feet. The body of Christ has feet. We're to be taking his gospel. In fact, the armor of God says having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Guess what's supposed to be shod? Your feet. We're to take the gospel. The degree to which we refuse to accept our responsibility within the church will determine the degree to which our church is less than what God can use to carry out his purposes. You ever thought about that? If I refuse to do something that I know I'm responsible to do within the church, the church is not all that God intended for it to be because I'm being disobedient. Understand that refusal to fulfill our responsibilities never builds the body up and makes it more effective. In fact, it does hinder it from accomplishing its God-given purpose. Here's a poem about me and the church. Said I to myself as I grumbled and growled, I'm sick of my church, and then how I scowled. The members unfriendly, the sermon's too long, in fact, it seems that everything's wrong. I don't like the singing, the church a disgrace, for signs of neglect are all over the place. I'll quit going there and won't give a dime, I have better use of my money and time. Then my conscience says to me, says he, the trouble with you is you're too blind to see, that your church reflects you, whatever it be. Now come and pray and serve cheerfully. Stop all your fault finding and boost it up strong. You'll find you'll be happy and proud to belong. Be friendly, be willing, and sing as you work. For churches aren't built by members who shirk. We have a responsibility in the church that only you can fulfill, only I can fulfill, because God's made us different. Are you fulfilling that? Brings us to a second key very quickly this morning is this partnership understands limitations. Let's look at verse 17 and 18. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? And he says, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. I think this is amazing when you study this. God has handpicked each of us and set us in the body of believers that he wants us to be in. We've all been to a restaurant or something. You've seen those vending machines that have the claw, right? You ever played with one of those? They are so much fun. Okay, when you look in there at all of those things that you can get, right? You, you single out that one thing that you're like, oh, I'd really like to have that. And your whole goal is to get that thing over and just simply get it to fall in that chute so you can grab it, right? God looks at all of us. And he, he says, I'm going to pick this one and I'm going to put them in that body of Christ. You know what? That's God that does that, not us. Because if we did, we'd pick all people that we get along with, all people that we see eye to eye with, all the people that we like. But you know what God does? He says, you know what? I'm going to test your faith. Let's put somebody in here that you're not so in favor of. Oh, and by the way, they're there because God put them there. Notice the text. God has set the members, each one of them. And where does he tell us that he put them? In the body as he pleased. God gives to each church the people that he wants. While we must each accept the responsibility within the life of the church, at the same time we must accept the fact that God did not intend or equip us to do everything. Can you do it all in church? I laugh every time I see it on social media, the post about, we're looking for a pastor who can do it all, who's preferably 40 and has the ministry experience of an 85-year-old. He can't do it all. Pastors can't, I can't do it all. In fact, the, the Bible says the pastor was never to do it all. In fact, what the pastor is to do is to equip the saints who have the diversity and uniqueness of gifts to do it all, which he has a part in that. 
One pastor said that his church was fill, filled with willing members. Somebody said, you mean everybody in your church is willing? And he said, yeah. 20% were willing to work and 80% were willing to let them. Too often the church suffers from members who will not do their part. But it can also suffer from members who will not let others do their part. Even as a pastor, I have to humbly admit time to time again that others in the body of Christ can do things better and quicker than me. And I'm not gifted in all things because I'm not Jesus Christ and neither are you. And so there has to be a willing, humble admission. I can't do it all. And I was never intended to do it all because God gave the body to do it all. A few years ago, I got a jigsaw puzzle for Christmas. Supposedly, the picture was of a white-tailed deer by a pond, and it was a big puzzle, like a thousand pieces. So I started putting it together, only to realize there was one piece missing. And so you looked at that puzzle, and as pretty as the picture was, you know what you noticed? That one little piece in the middle that was missing. And I bet you already know where that puzzle ended up, right? It's not in the closet anymore. As members of the body of Christ, we can be compared to jigsaw puzzle pieces. Each piece has protrusions and indentions. And the protrusions, they represent our strengths, our gifts, our talents, our abilities. And the indentions, they represent our weaknesses, the things that we're deficient in. And if you notice when a puzzle goes together, the other puzzle piece fills in the indention next to it. Perfectly. Those weaknesses, our limitations, our shortcomings, the things that we don't even know that we can do and maybe not do very well. But the neat thing is that the pieces complement one another and they produce a beautiful whole picture. And as each piece of the puzzle is important, so each member of the body of Christ is important. And when you put that puzzle together, you know what you notice? You don't notice the individual pieces. You notice the entire picture. You know what? Just like that one piece that's missing, that abstinence, that missing thing is so obvious it damages the picture. The whole is weakened when we are absent from the body of Christ. Just as when each puzzle piece is in its place, any one piece is not conspicuous. They all kind of blend into each other. You don't see the lines in the puzzle. You see the picture. What is it that people are supposed to see when they see the local church? They're supposed to see Jesus Christ, not you and I. In fact, maybe you say, well, I, I don't necessarily agree. Can I quote you a verse of scripture? Paul even said this, I must decrease so Christ can increase. In the body of Christ, you and I ought to be so willing to fade into the background, the only thing people see is Christ. It's not my position. It's not who I am. It's Christ. My gifts, they're Christ. My weaknesses. What did Paul say in Corinthians? My strength is made perfect in weakness. Whose strength? Christ. One of the things that can hinder the health and hold the growth of the church is for there to be an unwillingness to open up opportunities to get involved. That's why in the statistics in the life of a church, it's not necessarily the noses and the nickels, but the new believers involved in ministry. The ministry of a local church should be, and it should be a priority to get new people involved in the local church. Discipleship and service. We teach people how to serve the Lord. Do you have gifts? What are you good at? What do you like? What has God given you that I don't have that you can use to serve him? I think in many cases in the local church, we have missed the gifts that God has given to people because we will not let people serve. Well, they've done it forever. We don't need anybody to do that. Yeah, we do. Because how do you know that person that you're looking at isn't better equipped by God to do that? And you never know until you admit that maybe there's a limitation that somebody set. There's a third thing, though. Partnership understands honoring. In verses 19 through 23, it says this, And if we were all one member, where would the body be? And now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say the hand, I have no need of you. 
nor again the head of the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor. And on our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Partnership understands honoring. Paul says that we should have respect for one another because each of us is indeed, whether we realize it or not. This might be something that you need to just simply be encouraged with. I may not see my heart beating, but that doesn't mean that I want to try to get along without it. We need each other. We need to honor each other for the contribution to the life of the body that someone makes. Without the contribution that somebody makes this morning, you would not be sitting in as quiet a condition as you are right now. But a contribution that somebody is making allows you to be able to hear me without the cry of a baby drowning me out. Contributions. Notice what verse 22 says, and this is something you can underline. It says here in verse 22, No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker, and this is the phrase I want you to catch, they are necessary. You ever put something together and you get to the end, and you're like, why did they give me all these extra pieces, right? And your first thought is, well, <laughs> I guess maybe I didn't get it put together quite the right way. The pieces that we think in the local church that aren't necessary... God says are necessary. And you know what he's essentially saying? The members that we feel that aren't necessary, God says are necessary. And so if you think they're not necessary, you take that up with God. Because God's word says, under the inspiration that Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit, they are necessary to the body. All of them. You know, in your body, there's a lot of parts that you don't even acknowledge. I mean, how many of you thank God for your gallbladder, your spleen, your esophagus, your nose hairs? I mean, and you, you laugh about this, but without those things, without those, those lesser parts of the body, um, which are necessary... If you just say, well, we don't, we don't have any need of you, what does that say about the body of Christ? We don't want you. We don't need you. Anybody want to be a part of that body? We don't want you because you're not as desirable as somebody that can do this. Oh, so you're, you, let me get this straight. The only thing that you have to offer our church is that you can clean toilets. Well, we don't really have a need of that. What? Let them serve. Is it as important as playing a piano or making a PowerPoint or, or teaching young people? And the answer is, you bet it is. Because it's necessary. Your body is made up of individual cells. If the cells decide to go against each other in a way that's not what they were designed to function as, you know what happens? As a rebellion of cells in your stomach, you get indigestion. If you get a rebellion of cells in your brain, you call it insanity. If you get a rejection of cells doing what they are intended to do in the body, you develop cancer. And if the body is sick, something is wrong. Many of the problems in church today are the result of forgetting that the church is a body with a head, Jesus Christ. And everything underneath of that head answers to the head, which is Jesus Christ. And folks, that includes me too. And you. And even if you're sitting here this morning and you don't feel as though you're important in the body of Christ, the Bible says you're necessary. The head needs you for the body to function. Every member of the body must be encouraged and appreciated for what they do within the life of of the church. We need one another. Amen? It's necessary. Number four, very quickly, we need to wrap this up. Partnership understands awareness. Verse 24 through 26. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, 
and there should be no schism in the body and that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you're the body of Christ and members individually. Here's the thing. Partnership understands awareness. If you fell today on your way to leave, God forbid, and you injure your wrist, it would swell up. It would become very painful. And the rest of your body might feel so bad that it would sit up all night with it and keep it company, right? what the body says here in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul says the body of Christ should do this. When one member hurts, all should hurt. All should respond. But I guess the question really begs, do we? Do we really even care? When somebody in the body of Christ hurts, do you hurt with them? When somebody in the body of Christ rejoices, do you rejoice with them? When somebody in the body of Christ is honored, do you get upset because it's not you? Or do you honor them with everybody else? Maybe you've been to a doctor's office or a dentist where you were convinced that they really didn't care about you. Anybody ever been there? I remember when Bethany was pregnant with Rachel, we were still doctoring in Des Moines and driving from Brighton to Des Moines. And one day early on, we went to an appointment and the doctor came in and said, Hey, Brittany, how are you feeling today? And I kind of looked around like, who is Brittany? And Bethany corrected the gal, uh, it's, it's Bethany, not Brittany. And then a couple minutes later, she says, So, Brittany, let me understand this correctly. You're not having any issues. And I correct her this time and I said, No, it's Bethany. Oh, I'm sorry. And she went back to typing on her computer. And again, she goes, so when were you having these issues, Brittany? And and I'm sitting there, I'm going, okay, as if it wasn't bad enough that she called her Brittany three times and we corrected her twice, we go a step further and the information in her computer wasn't even correct. Brittany was married to somebody else who wasn't me that had my birthday. And I remember sitting there, I'm going, uh, we need to find somewhere else to doctor because these people clearly don't know what's going on here. And the thing is, to them, you were just another couple expecting a baby. They didn't greet you by name. They didn't remember your name. And even after you corrected them, they didn't know your name. And their computer system didn't make you feel like they knew who you were. You were led to believe they didn't care. If there was a place where people should care, it should be the church. That needs to just kind of sit and resonate for a moment. If there was a place where people should feel that people care, it should be a church. When people come into the local church, do they feel that we care about them? Notice what he says. Verse 25. So there's no division. There's no problem in the body. The members should have the same care for one another. The same care. And I would even dare say this. It's not that pastors should care about all the people. It's not that your deacons should care about all the people. It's that all the people should care about all the people that make up all the people. Amen? Care for one another. You must, and I, I can't say this enough, you must care for one another personally. You know why I never went back to that doctor's office? Because they didn't care about her personally. And we found a different doctor. And that doctor cares about Bethany. And I'm not Alfred or whoever it was. Personally, they care. They want to know about you. They want to know what makes you you. Can I say this this morning? Don't leave caring for somebody else to someone else. You care if nobody else does. Somebody walks through the door and and they're struggling with something. You care about them. Give them a hug. Write them a note. Go visit them. Because God designed the body to care for one another. And part of a partnership says, well, I'm not just going to turn a blind eye. I'm aware somebody's hurting and I can meet the need. 
The one another is a scripture, and we're going to look at these later. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Live in harmony with one another. Accept one another. Instruct. Serve. Bear with. Be kind and compassionate. Submit. Admonish. Encourage. Spur one another on. None of those commands were given to any special person to fulfill like a pastor. They were given to the individual members that make up the body of Christ. In fact, as you study the scriptures, you find that a pastor isn't hired by the church to do its work, but rather he's called to equip the saints that they might carry out the work of ministry, which one of those is meeting the needs of one another. Because it's hard to keep track of everybody's needs as a pastor. Believe me when I say it, I am keenly aware of the fact that I am insufficient when it comes to handling babies and messing with technology. Thank you to those that do, because I am keenly aware of that. The Bible says he gave some to be apostles, some teachers and prophets, evangelists, to prepare people for the work of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, whom from him the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. I want you to notice that God not only calls us to pursue individual Christ-likeness, but we're to do that together as a congregation. Second, he says this, that what happens if we're involved in life of the church as we should be is this, we're no longer tossed back and forth like the waves. We're blown here and there. You know why? Because we're united. And the church of God stands strong when it stands together. We need to close this morning. I want to ask you, God's will and its direction comes as the body of Christ functions as it was called to do. We understand that God has given us the body for many reasons, and apart from the body, we cannot know fully God's will for our relationship to the body. You need the body to discover the will of God for you. We need brothers and sisters in Christ for counsel, for prayer, for love, for comfort, encouragement, edification, exhortation, and that list could just keep going. And those are all the things we're going to look at. Part of God's will and desire for the believer is that they be actively involved in their church because they're one of the members of his church. So I close with two questions. Do you need to seek God's guidance in joining a church? And more than that, you need to seek God's guidance in serving through your church. If you have a responsibility, are you fulfilling it? Faithfully. Are you walking through all of those things I mentioned this morning? Are you aware? Do you understand your limitations, your responsibilities? May God help us to see that partnership with one another in the body of Christ is essential, not just for the individual, but for the whole body. So we, being many, amen, are one body in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, I'm thankful for the privilege to preach your word this morning. And Father, I, I pray and I trust that the Holy Spirit has used it to speak to us. Father, we are thankful for the uniqueness that you have given to each and every one that makes up the body of Christ. How thankful we are that we are not all the same. Because if we were, we would not be near as effective for the cause of Jesus Christ. We would not be able to sympathize with other people. We would not be able to edify, to exhort, to encourage differently if we were all the same. And Father, as we've looked at this morning and we've been reminded of this partnership, that as we come together because of the relationship that we have in Jesus Christ, that in that partnership there are some things that we have to be aware of. We have a responsibility. We have limitations. We need to be keenly aware that others in the body of Christ may be hurting. And that we, being many, are called to meet and to care and to serve and to minister to one another. 
as only God has gifted for us to be able to do. Father, we are thankful that we are unique and that through our uniqueness and through the cross of Jesus Christ, that you have placed us into the body of Christ where you want for the reason that you want to accomplish your will and purpose in and through the local church. And Father, for that we will forever be thankful. Thank you for using our uniqueness for your glory. Might we use our uniqueness to bring you glory in the church as we fulfill the Great Commission. We have asked all this in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.